some of y'all have been living this mediocre, metacrational, sad Christian life. And God said in the beginning of Genesis, my plan for you is to subdue, rule, and dominate on this earth. And you looking depressed, sad, and dejected. But I'm telling you, a shot of crazy faith is about to come across this screen and you are going to believe it. See, the thing you don't know about being close is when you're close, you can see details you couldn't see from far back. See, some of y'all saw me from the camera that was at the other side of the room. But one thing you can notice about me is I sweat on my nose before I sweat anywhere else. So because I'm this close to you, you can see the beads of sweat on my nose. And God's saying, I want you to be that close that when I make a move, you don't miss a thing. And some of us have been trying to reach God from across the room. Some of us have kept God at an arm's length, been like, God, I'll do my thing over here. But when you need me, you know how to really get me. And God says these next instructions of crazy faith may be coming in whispers. They may have to be something that you only get after five or six days in my presence. It may be something that I only give when you shut off your iTunes and the radio and the Instagram. And for the next week and a half, you drive in silence. Why? Because I want to be close. I want to hear you. I want to sense you. I want to feel you. I want to know you because I will not miss the next thing you want to do in my life because there was too much space. People who walk in crazier faith are committed to being close. So this is the transition from Elijah going to a person who is like many of us that will walk in crazy faith. I gave the offering. I come to church. I serve. But what if that's not it? The reason I titled this series Crazier Faith is because God challenged me on my time away since I preached the last message. He said, Michael, that was the first chapter. It wasn't the finale. And I was kind of like, have you ever told God, it's enough. Like, you did it. I am preaching to you today in Tulsa, Oklahoma, in an arena that I should not be in. I got a message from God 37 days after I became the lead pastor of a church that was birthed out of a man and woman's heart to go to North Tulsa to reverse the curse. They led it for 16 years and then handed me the baton. There was 300 picky people that were still in the church at the time trying to choose if they were going to stay faithful. And 37 days of me being found faithful, making sure I stayed in a place to receive the favor and made it final. And I didn't, I literally walked away from the music industry and said, God, if you want to use me to be a pastor, I don't know nothing. I don't know how to pronounce half the names in the Bible. Lord, I don't even know how to use a concordance. But if you call me to it, I'm crazy enough to step out in it. And 37 days after me being dependent on God, I go to my daughter's room and I type this document. And this document I still got it here. And the first thing I said is the Spirit Bank Event Center will be Transformation Church. We had no money in the bank. Nobody to co-sign us. But God gave me a crazier faith vision. And the reason that I'm standing here talking to you is because God said to me after he did all of this miracle and we got the building and we paid it off, he said that was the first chapter. And some of y'all are so scared to walk in the promise of God that you're trying to figure out how it's going to happen. And God said, I got that. If you would just trust me to step out in crazy faith. This man asked for a double portion and he stayed close. And this is what happened in 2 Kings 2.11. I'll paraphrase it. All that you need to know is as they were walking in verse 11, along and, take it, uh, and talking suddenly, I mean mid-sentence, a chariot of fire appeared, drawn by horses of fire. It drove between the two men separating them. EJ was carried by a whirlwind into heaven. Verse 13, Elijah picked up Elijah's cloak. 
which had fallen when he was taken up. He was close enough to catch it. Then Elijah returned to the bank of the Jordan River. Verse 15, when the group of prophets that weren't close, people who loved God, people who went to church every Sunday, people who gave, when the group of prophets from Jericho saw from a I just want to let you know you can serve God from a distance. I just want to let you know you can post your Bible scriptures and still miss out on God's full purpose for you because you did it from a distance. God doesn't want distant disciples. He wants you close. When they saw what happened from a distance, they exclaimed, Elijah's spirit rest upon Elisha. And they went to meet him and bowed to the ground before him. Can I give you a point? The crowd can tell when you're walking in crazier faith. Elijah did not have to make a public statement to let everybody know, I've changed. I know you saw me last week. Got a new coat, got the double portion. God said, just do you, boo. And when you do you, the crowd can tell something different. I don't got to prove it. I don't gotta. Do y'all know one of the things that God has allowed me to do as I walk as the lead pastor of Transformation Church is not have to prove that I need to be validated by anybody else but God. The reason that I can stand up here and know that what I'm doing, whether y'all clap or not, whether you come or not, whether you give or not, it don't matter because I wasn't called by you. I was called, approved, and verified by God himself. One of the funniest things that ever happened to me is on Instagram, they have this thing called the blue check that when you get a certain number of of, of, of followers and people going um, to um, following what you're doing, they give you this blue check to verify you. And there was millions of people following us and I had no verification. And I told my wife, I said, God did it to me on purpose. (laughs) He did it to me on purpose because he wanted me to remember that it does not matter what man says, I'm verified by God. And I don't know who I'm prophesying to today, but somebody needs to lift your hands and receive this. This next level will not come from a committee's approval. You're gonna have to step in crazy faith knowing that you are verified by God. This man was verified by God. The anointing on his life was obvious. And so what does he do? He starts living in crazy faith. So much so that when that man put the cloak on water, the water split. This man would walk into situations where people were dying and they would get healed because he showed up. What I'm telling you is these are not mystical Bible characters that God is trying to do this thing back then. Miracles, signs, and wonders are for the church today. The problem is we don't have faith to believe it can happen. So we believe for crowds when God wants to hear cancer. How was service? It was amazing. People was there who got healed. Oh, oh my gosh. It was amazing. The lights, the pyrotechnics, the, 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 the production. God said, but who got purpose from that? Did somebody find purity in that? Did somebody's life change because of that? And I'm telling you, I will not lead a powerless church. And I will not live a powerless life. There is a double portion with my name on it because I am going to have the faith to live out on the limb. If you go live in crazier faith, go ahead and give God a shout of praise. Don't play with me. This is just the beginning. I need to shake you up right now. 
because some of y'all have been living this mediocre, metacrational, sad Christian life. And God said in the beginning of Genesis, my plan for you is to subdue, rule, and dominate on this earth. And you looking depressed, sad, and dejected. But I'm telling you, a shot of crazy faith is about to come across this screen and you are going to believe again. Elijah starts living in crazy faith. And then he starts living in crazier faith. Doing stuff, BP, that nobody said he could do. How do you, how do you go and buy a building and pay it off in six months with people donating from around the world? Do they go to your church? Are they your members, though? Like, these are questions like bankers and stuff. Like, do they, like, do they... Do they know what you're doing with the money? Like, <laughs> it may not make sense to you, but it's about to make a miracle for me. Oh, that's gangster. It may not make sense to you. It, it may not make sense when the doctors tell me that my son is nonverbal and he's about to be six and there, there's only so much that we can do, but God's given me a word. I don't need nobody's help. I'm too pumped up already. God's already given me a word. So it may not make sense to you, Mr. Doctor, Mrs. Speech Therapist. It may not make sense. But for Michael Alexander Todd Jr., it's about to make a miracle. Woo! Somebody needs to get another level of indignant and say it might not make sense. But it's about to make a miracle. See, when you start living in crazier faith, you start doing different stuff. When you see a door, you start thinking about how it's coming down. When you see a mountain, you start thinking about how it's going to move. See, a lot of times when we're living at this low level, we see a door and we start thinking about why it can't happen. It's closed to me. Every door has hinges. Y'all. Every door has hinges. Enough knocking, and if I got to get gangster, I'll kick that. Some of y'all need to get a level of faith that says if I gotta kick this door down, woo, if I gotta walk up to it and knock over and over until the hinges start to shake. I'm not talking about no low level faith, Tony. I'm talking crazier faith. Somebody shot at me crazier faith. Crazy. However you've been believing, crazier. Whatever you've been saying, crazier. Whatever you've been confessing, go crazier. Well, my family, they won't understand. When I tell them I'm leaving Florida and I'm moving to Tulsa, Oklahoma, Well, my business and my music and my everything is in Atlanta. My connections are in L.A. My company is in. It don't matter. Because this next season, we're moving in crazier faith. I don't got time to go through all of it, but you need to read all the second Kings this week. And look at Elijah. And look how you pass down a double portion to Elisha. And he starts living this out. And now I want to go to when he dies. Oh, dang. Sad. You're going to die at some point. My question is, what will they say about you when you're dead? The worst compliment that you could ever get when you die is something short like this. He was cool. I mean, when they, when they, when they... Read your epitaph. Will it be like, they were fun. You just summed up 89 years of life. They were fun. No, tell me more about them. I mean, just the life of the party. What? They didn't do nothing that made anybody move into anything else. They didn't change the trajectory of the people that would come behind them. 
the Bible says the least you can do is a good man leaves an inheritance for his children. He ain't leave. We ain't get nothing but pictures. I mean, he looked nice, but. See, faith builds a legacy. Fear builds a legacy, too. And many of us are living in the fear of our grandparents and our parents. The reason you won't step out because you never saw anybody do it. The reason you won't go to counseling is because we don't tell people our business, but you jacked up. And now your kids is going to pornography to feel, let me stop. But if you could ever really deal with your own stuff. Fear is now passing down generationally. But that scripture said, now, faith. Today as I'm sitting here, I believe that something can switch in your life. That where fear has been the primary operating system of your life, eject it and burn the back up. Today, you're going to insert faith in there. And from now on, we don't just live in crazy faith. We live in crazier faith. God, if you said it, I will obey. God, if you want me to go, I'm already moving. God, if you want me to stay, I ain't moving till you bless me. There is a level of crazier faith. That is available to you right now. This is my real message right here. Five minutes. Second Kings 13, 14. Elijah gets sick. He's about to die. But I can imagine that at the end of his life, he start reminiscing. They, tell, they, they say that, that when you get to the end of your life, your memory keeps the highlights of your life. And you start thinking about all of the amazing things that happened during your life. And I think he was probably going through the catalog in his mind of all of the amazing things that God did. And it came to the end of his predecessor's life, EJ. And when he was thinking about, how did I even get here? He said, oh, shoot. It was the crazier faith of EJ that I got transferred a double portion of. I know I'm old and I've been living in crazier faith all my life, but I wonder, can I transfer this crazy faith I got to somebody else? So there's this king named Joash, and he had been getting his tail whooped in his kingdom for years because their people were sinning. And Joash comes to mourn the prophet Elijah, look at it, 2 Kings 13, 14. When Elijah was in, his, uh, uh, was in his last illness, King Jehoash of Israel visited him for, and wept over him. My father, my father, I see the chariots and the charioteers of Israel. And he was crying. And this is what happened in verse 15. Elijah said, man, quit all that. I'm about to die, man. Stop crying. Get a bow and some arrows. That's crazy. That don't make no sense. At TBN, our mission is to use every available means to reach as many individuals and families as possible with the life-changing gospel of Jesus Christ. Thank you for helping make the gospel of grace go around the world. Without you, we couldn't do it. God bless you.